Uh, can get started. Hi guys, um, my name's Kirsten. I'm currently an FY1 doctor in London at St. George's Hospital, um, doing the Academic Foundation Programme. Um, and working with Mind the Bleep this year, leading our final year section. Um, so me and Eamon are here to talk to you about some top tips of how to approach final year. No, saying it's me, I'm Eamon, I'm one of the, another F1. Um, working at Newham on cardio, I guess. I like cardio, so I might be doing that in the future. Nothing else really for me, pretty boring person. <laughs> I think we have a, we should be hopefully having a little talk by the BMA. We're just waiting on Daniel and hopefully he'll be able to put something up. If not, then we'll just get started, I guess. Yeah, you can always slot it in a little bit later. Yeah. Um, Anybody hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Great. Well, thank you. I've, sorry, are we live now? Yeah, we're live. <laughs> We've got people trickling in, so whenever you want to start, right. go for it. Okay, sorry everybody, my computer just completely crashed out on me. I can't seem to get my um, camera back up, so I'll just leave that anyway. But at least you can hear me. All right, I'll, I'll share my screen now then, so I've got something in the chat too. Okie dokie. Right here. Okay, there we go. That's me on the screen. All right, okay, so I'm just going to be, this. yeah, we've got a couple of people tripping in. Okay, yeah, I'll just go for it. I know a lot of people are going to watch this anyway, so so I don't need to wait for everybody to sort of come in. Um, so, yeah, sorry you can't see me. I was I was there um, a minute ago. <laughs> my computer crashed, and now it says my camera's been used by something else which which will hit a minute ago anyway it doesn't matter um so yeah i'm, I'm dan um I'm from the bma um i'm just going to speak to you a couple of minutes before the session starts so uh excuse the overwhelming um text that's on on the screen um basically just to break it down um i'm guessing you guys are all watching the final years um if you're not already a member of the bma obviously it's a very important time to be a member um if you join today using um, the QR code on the screen or the link that I've put in the chat um, and then drop me an email after you've done so you'll get a 10 pound Amazon voucher so this isn't available um, online if you go if you go online and join the BMA as final years you'll just start paying the three pound 75 a month and that's that's that um, so yeah an exclusive to, to mind the bleep that you get a 10 pound Amazon voucher every join so it basically covers your first three months of membership back by by getting the voucher um, so yeah so take it up it's it's obviously a pivotal time to be member of the BMA um, and yeah we'd, we'd like more of you to to, to join um, ahead of obviously what's of, of what's going on and what's going to continue to be going on for a few months yeah it looks like um so I, I'm, I'm hoping everyone knows by now what the BMA is um, and what, what, what's sort of going on at the moment um, so essentially we're your trade union and professional organization um, doctors and med students so sometimes we get confused with um, companies like MDU and MPS, they're indemnity companies, so they don't do the same thing as us um, with with union. There is another small union, but to be honest, it's it's it's, it's a couple of thousand at best. Last time I checked, um, we've got 193,500 members. Um, so yeah, so we have sort of that's that's um, just doctors and med students, so not nurses or anything. BMA is just for doctors and med students. So that's an incredible. Uh, amount and, and I've never known in my eight years of being affiliated with the BMA of being so high. Um, so yeah, obviously the power comes in in the numbers. So with everything that's going on with the pay restoration, um, it's a good time to, to join. So yeah, uh, I could talk all night about what's going on. I'm sure everyone knows what's what's going on at the moment. Everything's a bit of a stalemate. So I wish I had a bit more of an update to give you, but I, I don't. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll just continue we we'll just continue with the strikes as is. I, I, my personal view is this might go through till the next election, but I, I don't really know how how it's going to play out. I mean, by now I would expect it. things a year ago when we, when we started this to to have gone somewhere at this point. But yeah, the government are not very forthcoming um, with things. So just okay, uh, just in terms of things that can help you um, now you're in final year. I won't focus so much on the on the pay restoration stuff. Because um, hopefully we've got that nice and wrapped up by the time you guys start your F1 
um, next year. So we'll see. To be fair, I said that to the same cohort last year, <laughs> and it didn't happen. But yeah, here we go. Another, another year. Um, so yeah, in terms of things that you can use day to day, we've got BMA uh, library. So I'm hoping that everyone knew about this already, but you you never had to buy any any textbooks or anything or journals because we had everything and we still have everything that you could possibly need there. So you just go on our website, log in, um, search for the books that you, you need and, and they'll come up. BMJ Learning, same things. We've got tons and tons of revision tools on there to, to help you. Um, so you've got full access to that as being a member. Clinical Key, you might have Clinical Key through your med schools already. Um, you've got Clinical Key also through the BMA, um, and there's no paywalls with, with the BMA Clinical Key, um, so everything is completely available to you. So that is a really good point of care tool. Um, it's also got every possible textbook and journal related to, to any condition ever that, that you could find um, instantly. Um, BMJ, if you are finally years watching, which I assume most of you are, um, you get the BMJ through the post every uh, every week for free. All you need to do is upgrade to that. So you get the BMJ, the paper version come through. You just need to give us a call and say, yep, I'm finally here now. Can you send it to me? So that's more of an opt-in service. So you won't just start getting that um, because you're finally here. You have to just give us a call. So that's a little inside secret there. Um, we've got a really good wellbeing um, service. It sounds open 24 seven. It's free to everybody regardless of, of whether you're a member or not. Um, so obviously completely confidential of, of the med schools. And the unique thing is um, we'd have the choice of either speaking to a, a, a counselor or, or a peer support doctor. Um, last thing, I think, yep. Um, specialty Explorer, Explorer tool. So this is this is an online psychometric test, um, not a test in that sense, just a, a nice test. Um, and it'll ask all sorts of work-life balance questions. Um, and then at the end, it will give you a, a detailed report listing the top suited specialties according to uh, the answers you've given. Um, really good to do it now um, and then sort of in a couple of months and then sort of joining your F1, F2 and just see how your taste change and it'll give you a bit of guidance in terms of uh, choosing choosing your specialty. I know it's quite early to be thinking about this, but uh, it's, it's just it's, it's a good tool to sort of start using now. That's it. Um, so thanks, thanks for listening. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll let you get on with the session, but remember if you're not already a member, uh, take take advantage of this offer. It's only here today. Um, if you join, you get a £10 Amazon voucher. Membership's £3.75 a month for final years. So it is like getting three months of your membership back through an Amazon voucher. Um, so yeah, that's only available here. Use that link, use that QR code um, and drop me an email afterwards on detail at bma.org.uk and I'll make sure that you get your voucher. Um, so yeah, follow those instructions if you want to join. That's it. I'll let you crack on the session and thanks, thanks guys for having me. Even and Kirsten, thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. So that's the BMA. I'll just put the slides back on. Can you see that, Kirsten? Yeah, it's all good. Great. OK, so we'll go again for introducing ourselves. Welcome, everybody. The people are still trickling in. And obviously, we'll be recorded and we'll post it all online. So you can always access it there as well. But welcome to our first Mind the Bleep session. We've got a lot planned for this year and we'll talk a little bit more about it but it's great to all have you all here but today we'll be really talking kind of about final year in general really and i guess the best thing about coming in person is obviously we wanted to kind of make it you know a q a you guys we want you to ask as many questions as possible really say everything that you want and we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it because honestly if you're thinking something or if there's something that you've got on your mind, then somebody else probably does as well. It'll be helpful to everybody. Um, so a bit about me, we'll go through that again, I guess. I'm an F1, I'm at Newham Hospital currently, doing cardio, uh, went to UCL for uni, and yeah, that was last year, finished now. So you guys won't be far from <laughs> where we are now, and we're not far from where you are now as well. Kirsten? Yeah, thanks, Eamon. So yeah, the purpose of the session is really to go for an overview, but also mainly to dispel any worries you guys have and to let for us to let you know how we can support you um, with content and revision, but also from a well-being and nervousness and anxieties about applications and admin stuff transitioning into F1. Um, so I'm currently an F1 doctor, so I've just gone through this all myself very recently. Um, I'm currently working at St. George's um, doing general medicine and respiratory, and I studied in Oxford. Um, so yeah, just as I, 
as Eamon said, feel free to go through the comments. We'll try answer the questions as we go along. So it's a kind of free flowing discussion. So um, yeah, thank you for the people that have joined and definitely take advantage of the fact that you're here live so that we can pick up your questions. And no question is a silly question because often, yeah, everyone will be thinking the same thing. And it's nice, hopefully nice to hear from people that have been through it and are now on the other side. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's cliche, but it's true. You know, <laughs> it's always, we always really encourage you guys getting involved and saying as much as you can. So a little bit about kind of what we wanted to talk about today is it's here, you know, we're going to talk about, I guess, the timeline of the year. It's a busy year. I remember having no clue really what was happening beyond two months in advance, if that. <laughs> it's kind of, you just things just happen to you as a final year. So the fact you're here is really good. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, tips from placement and what to kind of say, no, don't, I don't want to do that, or yes, can I have this opportunity? Exam prep, elective advice, and then, you know, a little bit about, obviously, the NHS currently, it's not an interesting place to be working in. So we'll talk about that, also, obviously, also SFP and mentorship as well. Uh, go on, Kirst. Yes, yeah, so just an introduction for those of you who aren't familiar with who mine the bleep are or haven't used any of our content before. Um, we are a free medical education platform and the whole kind of concept behind Mind the Bleep is that we want to standardise medical education across the board, across different unis and different experiences. Um, so we're a whole team of doctors who work alongside full-time jobs to help build resources to you guys, but also beyond, so from your daily challenges, so all the practical life tips that medical school don't teach you. And then in terms of from where me and Eamon come in is we're leading the final year programme this year. So we're working and in the middle of recruiting a whole set of doctors to teach you guys everything you need to know for finals um, matched to the MLA curriculum. So we're going to be going through all the big hitters um, so lectures covering everything you need to know about cardiology, respiratory, gastro, et cetera, et cetera, throughout medicine, surgery and specialties across the year. And we appreciate everyone's finals at different times, but hopefully you can still benefit from the majority of our sessions. Um, so, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we try to do it as early as possible because we know some people have their finals, you know, in December, et cetera. And, you know, it's big hitters for even the little things. I think the next session we've got is this Thursday on oncology. And that'll be the first, like, actual medicine in terms of teaching lecture. But there's going to be loads. And we're hoping every Monday or Tuesday and every Thursday from now to uh, January, we're basically going to be having a lecture. So, you know, you ever find yourself free, we'll be advertising loads, obviously, on the Facebook, the Instagram, um, and hopefully med school reps if they're getting in contact with you guys but do keep an eye out and obviously if you need any help then just come and ask any questions as well cool. cool so let's get started in terms of how the how final year works it is an absolute mess there's loads of things happening at once and it's kind of really all back to back I managed to find this really good graphic from the GMC and unfortunately it's from the previous year, it's not from this year, but it kind of maps out pretty much everything that's happening in final year. It's a bit small, so I don't know if you guys, hopefully you can see it, but they kind of split it up into the GMC process, the F1 UK FPO process, and then other. The GMC process, you can kind of ignore. What's going to happen is the GMC will get in touch with you throughout the year really and they will basically guide you when they email you reply quick don't like hang on to it because i've known people who have and it's just delayed things and they've had to like beg the gmc to accept them basically and it's not going down well so yeah if you get an email just respond quickly sort it out and you should hopefully be getting your gmc number soon if you're not you might already have them even so that's all they're really exciting we also then have the, I'll go to the other at the bottom. Um, and, you know, 
there's not much really there apart from the PSA. The PSA, everyone sits at a different time. Normally, it's somewhere between January, February to about the end of May. Um, and that will be communication from your university to effectively tell you what you, you know, they'll tell you when to do it and hopefully give you some resources. Most unis don't, to be fair. Um, we have, on the Mind the Bleed, we have a really good series that was published last year and it's on YouTube. We'll also be doing some overall general revision lectures and maybe even some cheat sheets too. But that will all be closer to the time year. That's not anytime soon, really, for the PSA. But just be aware that's an exam that everybody will have to sit really if they want to practice as an F1. And don't worry if you fail, you can always reset. It's fine. Cool. But. Now let's focus in a little bit on that middle block for the old timeline, because that this is messy. And actually, the nice thing is, hopefully you guys have done already that a lot of the messy part, you know, applications and submitting things for UKFPO and Oreo. It's a trash website. It's really <laughs> old, but we've all got to use it. And guess what? It stays with you throughout training. So we have to get used to it, I guess. But you know, in terms of what's going on here, you apply for Oreo, apply for F1, you then have some opportunity to, and also you're applying for the normal FP, normal foundation program, but also you're applying for the SFP, so specialized foundation program and the FFP as well. And I guess the nice thing is for the normal FP, you can change your options, you know, all the way up until quite later on. Probably the one thing here that you guys won't have to deal with is the SJT. You can knock that out. And I mean, I'm not going to go into the debate about whether it's <laughs> a good or a bad change, but it's happened. It's there. Your year had, now has a completely different application process where it's all randomized, as I'm sure you know. And again, we just kind of have to shrug our shoulders and, and deal with it. The good thing is, I guess, is that there's one less exam for you. So really from now to Christmas, all you've got to really worry about is finals from a medical perspective, from a medicine perspective, with PSA coming a little bit later. So that's all nice in a way, because we had another exam that we had to do. And in terms of the key dates, so now these are the dates for your year from the GMC website. Okay, so hopefully 4th October, everybody submitted all their stuff. SFP will start coming in around 10th Jan, and then it will, they'll be doing, they'll be releasing offers from the 10th and 9th, 9th. There's multiple rounds, so there's kind of like clearing rounds in a way when people accept or reject jobs. And don't worry if you don't get off from the first one, a lot of people do get offers later on. Then the, de the deadline to kind of amend your F your foundation program preferences is actually much later on, so it's the 14th of February. So really you are able to kind of adjust things quite late. 21st of February to 1st of March, the FPP offers are given out. And then the 7th of March, all the normal foundation program offers are given out and everyone basically kind of knows by then which foundation school you applied to. From that point, the timetable gets a little bit less specific and less organized. Every foundation school will have a different process for onboarding you. Some foundation schools will further strat, you know, organize you into, super, into separate groups. So I can talk about, for example, London last year split you into North, like North Central, Northeast, Northwest, Southeast and Southwest. I heard they weren't doing that this year. I'm not sure. Um, but that's just what I've heard from the grapevine. I also know London's gone bigger. There's some changes as well. EBH has knocked out the window and East Anglia has taken a bunch of those hospitals. So the boundaries are all changing and they're always changing. And it's, it's never good. I don't know why they change it, but it just makes life more confusing for all of us. And yeah, I mean, that's all about the dates. Obviously, if you guys have any questions about the dates, it is really confusing. And how it will kind of feel is everything is just coming back to front. And in terms of, I guess, 
you know preparing for it now kind of just go over and do hopefully all your kind of you know just brush up with all your medicine really um until your PSA time and that's when it's more pharmacology specific and you have to learn a bunch of medicines but otherwise with the SJT gone hopefully the year is a bit less hectic the other thing that we wanted to talk about really was like placement what do you do in placement because I remember I remember being at uh, final year and a bunch of F1s were like here's a discharge summary go do it it's really good for your learning it's not good for your learning don't do it <laughs> um yeah you th th think what you need to do is think at this stage what do i need to know before an f1 and what can i learn on the job and things like discharge summaries are definitely things that you can learn on the job you don't really need to know how to do them beforehand understand how to do it in terms of you know watch doctors doing it and see what they kind of write but a lot of it you can you can definitely learn the job and there is that uh, you know a few days of onboarding prior to starting the job that you do have things that i would really recommend i guess from you guys is procedures you know things like bloods abgs i mean catheters i guess if you want to include it you know whenever you get an opportunity to do a procedure don't shy away because ultimately there will come a time when you're an f1 where you're expected to be doing these things and if you can't i mean it's fine there's always somebody you can escalate to but it makes your life more difficult and honestly the job goes so much easier so just practice whenever you're whenever you can and i guess chase those opportunities as well so you know a good place is for example a &E, triage everyone gets a cannula you need to go practice on cannulas. You can go there and do that. ATEs as well. So I guess the acute management for when you're on call as an F1 is is really, you know, important. So I guess see and watch some F1s if you can. Do ATEs. That's always really helpful. See what they document as well because that's, you know, again, understanding a little bit about what they think is important and what's not. And obviously I say F1, but really you can follow anyone doing an ATE. Practice some yourselves. I think, you know, I don't think I've done one on a real patient before starting F1, but it's always good and always chase those opportunities if you can. Another thing is, you know, I feel like I'm preaching to the preached it, to the converted, but when it's, I, we, I found it really good that when I was in placement, go to the, ask patients, can I just take five minutes and practice this cardio, this cardio exam on you? It will be really rushed. I won't be, you know, like all, it'll be, I'll be running around, but if they're aware of it beforehand and they're happy with it and just treat it like an exam scenario, get someone to watch you, that's all really helpful because then you do also pick up signs, especially if your uni does bring in real patients, which I think some do, some don't. But also, you know, even for OSCEs with, history taking as well kind of I guess practice doing focused histories shorter histories time it within whatever time frame your uni's OSCEs are and then another thing is maybe basic understanding of documentation really ward round entries if you can ask can I do the ward round entry I'm sure that everyone would love you to do it it will save them a job but also actually just do a few so you know what kind of things to be writing, how to kind of structure it, and actually a few different bits and bobs, because I found that that was something that I did and it was really helpful coming in because then you, you, you're you not just out there clueless in terms of what to write or what to type, but you've already had some experience. And there's a bunch of abbreviations as well, like IPOP for input output monitoring or you know PTOT, which again, you only get to really understand them once you've practiced a little bit. So I'd always recommend that. But it's your final year really of no responsibility. You know, or enjoy it. Don't overwork yourself. Obviously work and prepare yourself to be an F1, but really, really make sure that you're kind of saying it's okay. I will be fine. Hopefully I'll pass these exams know what you need to do and just enjoy the year if someone's saying let's go do something like do it it's kind of your last opportunity because once you become a doctor everyone kind of gets thrown across the country everyone's so far away organizing things are so difficult with rotors 
So remember always to enjoy the year as well. That's great. Um, before we move on, has anyone got any questions for what we've just covered about the timeline or about making the most of placement? If anyone does, I'll let you know, Kirsten. Yeah, okay. So let's move on to exam preparation advice. So yeah, final year is a really busy time because obviously you've still got to go to placement um, as much as you do in other years, but you've also got exam preparation to do alongside placement, which is can be a lot to juggle. And then in the back of your mind, if you're doing the SFP, you've got that to prepare for. So it's a lot to juggle. So I would really recommend starting early, even if you feel like exams are really far away, just get your notes in order, kind of figure out what you feel more confident with and what you're finding a little bit more tricky, and then try and identify gaps in your knowledge. And then when you do go on placement, you can ask questions um, that you're not comfortable with, or you can, you know, have a five minute chat with one of the doctors or a 10 minute chat about one of the conditions. You say, look, I really don't understand the COPD management. Can we go over it? So starting early is really helpful because then you minimize the panic towards the end of the year. This year, things are changing a little bit as well um, with the MLA curriculum. So everyone will be sitting the same exam and sitting the MLA papers. Um, so it's really useful because obviously every medical school is taught differently to make sure you've covered everything on the MLA curriculum. And hopefully this is where our lectures will come in as well. We'll make sure we'll cover everything important to know and go over what you need to know, make you aware of what's on the curriculum itself. It's a big PDF document that you can find on Google and that can work as a nice tick sheet, can aid you in planning your revision. Um, so just make sure not just to go off your own uni's curriculum, but just double checking that everything on the MLA you've covered to a good enough standard. And then my other top tip would be to revise the hardest topics first. So I would always fall into the trap of going for what I enjoyed the most or what I knew I just covered um, because it's easy. It's easy to make those notes. It's easy to kind of practice questions and get them right. Um, but I would actually say start with the hardest topics first, because if you can get them prepped and in your mind early, then you'll feel much less anxious and stressed about it. So, for example, for me, neuro was a source of anxiety. So I tackled all of neuro first. And then once I got neuro out of the way, I was like, look, that's fine. I'm happy with gen med and surgery. Let's just tidy that up and make sure I know, know it well. Um, so it's all depending on what you find comfortable with but I start with the hardest topics first whilst you've got time because if you do it the reverse which I did in the earlier years you'll soon realize you run out of time for the hardest topics that you don't know and then that becomes very stressful and then take advantage of the resources you can find online so I know lots of people use question banks and lots of the mind the bleep talks are on YouTube so if you can't make them live we'll be uploading them onto YouTube or if we've not covered that topic yet you can find last year's content on YouTube so once I've finished a topic in revision say gone through all of cardiology I then look on YouTube for a mind the bleep lecture just to summarize everything in cardiology and it's nice to kind of have a lecture that covers all the high yield information for MCQs um in one place so you can just feel confident that you've got that broad overview and then in terms of tackling mcqs themselves think about the patient from a medical school exam point of view they're going to try create a typical patient for you that has a condition so if you're being asked to come up with a diagnosis think about the patient what's their age group um what's their sex are they male or female because it's really useful to know for example, if it's a young patient, it's unlikely to be kind of long-standing cardiovascular disease or lifestyle mediated. It's probably more likely to be genetic. Um, whereas you can think the other way around, um, if people that are older, are they very comorbid? Is 
things like dementia occur in older age groups. So really use the age and the sex of the patient to guide you. And also if they've told you risk factors about um, the patients, for example, they have a smoking pack history, they're a heavy alcohol drinker, more than likely that means that that will aid you to a diagnosis. It's probably something that has contributed to their disease. Um, so yeah, really have a think about that. And then in terms of what to revise for MCQ questions, um, make sure you know investigations and there's often multiple investigations for conditions, but be aware of the ones that will give you the diagnosis. So um, in an MCQ question, they would probably ask what's the most likely investigation that will give you the diagnosis or what's the most important investigation. And obviously first line things like ECGs and urine dips, all very useful in your diagnostic workup. But it's important to think what will give you the diagnosis and just have an awareness of what specialist treatments are available. Um, you won't be expected to know the kind of niche um, details like doses and the regimes of how often, but just be aware of what can be done because that can also be um, a common exam question. And people say, why do I need to know this as an F1? Um, it's because when you are referring patients, you want to know what to ask for. So if you've got a patient with a tricky rheumatology disease, say you meet them at GP, when you do refer them to the rheumatologist, what can they expect to receive? Or as a clinician, what do you want them to do that you can't? So even though it's not really an F1's job to initiate these specialist treatments, it's really good to have an awareness. Um, and then just in terms of prepping overall, I like to write a timetable um, just to know that you've covered all the different subjects and topics in time. Great, so let's move on. So for OSCEs, um, some unis do these maybe a week after their MCQ, some a few months after, but it's really important not to forget your MCQ knowledge because once you've prepped for the OSCE, it's kind of like a driving test, it comes second nature, and get your exam all slick. Where you can do well and score well and make sure you pass is in like presenting and also in the Viva questions after and your MCQ knowledge will really help you with the Viva. Um, Another common downfall is not preparing for the smaller exams. So for example, surgical shorts like neck and vascular or mini exams like hand exam or some more specialist neuro exams. Um, don't not prepare for these. You perhaps spend less time on them, but it's definitely good to cover because for example, a hand exam can be a whole station and that's worth exactly the same as a whole cardio station. So you should be just as prepared. Other tip is to practice on non-medics. We often found that when we practiced on each other um, that you'd almost put your arms out for a segment of the exam kind of expecting what's to come next. So don't forget your patients in the, the actors in the OSCE are trained but they won't they will be completely guided by you so practice how you might want to ask a patient to kind of position their arms or their legs or instruct them. So practice on non-medics to just practice the flow of the station. And then for each OSCE exam, I would write a list of differentials of the main presenting complaints that can come up. Um, and that will help in terms of your viva preparation, just to think about which conditions you need to know about. So obviously excluding your most urgent life-threatening conditions, also think about what's common with OSCEs. They're not gonna give you something super rare they're going to give you something common and you're going to be expected to be able to talk about it so write down your three or four main conditions you think are the most common cardiology or respiratory conditions and then work backwards think about what investigations you would need for those conditions and therefore you'd like to do on your patient to exclude or include and then what manage what first line management can you start them on Great. So after all this exam stuff, a lot of people have their elective at the end of finals. So it's something to look forward to. Um, it can feel really daunting planning an elective because of the amount of flexibility that you're given in terms of where you can go and what you can do. But what I would say is really think about what you want to gain out of the time period you've got, because this is a really unique opportunity. 
um, and you want to spend it well. So have a think about where's, where, where are you interested in seeing how medicine's practiced? Because each country has a very different culture, a very different healthcare system. Um, so consider that. And also you will have free time outside placement. So think about where you want to spend your afternoons and evenings and weekends. So what is a place that genuinely interests you? And then in terms of specialty, you can think of it two ways. Is this something I've always wanted to see but never come across at medical school? Or is this something I'm considering as a career? Um, so if, for example, um, I did my elective in dermatology, but I only did one week at university. So I use this as a chance to kind of see if that's even right for me as a career path before I pursue it any further. And you can also do non-clinical placement things, which a lot of people don't realise. So people that I know have done academic research at different university institutes, or they've taken on kind of volunteering charity roles at um, healthcare based charities across the world. So very, very broad. And so just team up with your friends, see where your common interest lies in terms of specialty, hospital versus rural, charity research or medicine, and then also think about um, where in the world they wanna go. But you can obviously do an elective on your own. That's also a really good idea, a good time to solo travel. Um, and then top tips for funding, speak to your university, their medical, your medical school, see what they can offer you. Um, and then also, it might have changed, but I don't think it has, but the NHS bursary can offer support to help cover your accommodation costs whilst you're on placement and all of the kind of admin costs that you feel like you shouldn't really be paying for. So things like visas, vaccinations, um, kind of even travel from your university town to the airport. Um, if it's by public transport, that can be covered. So make the most because elective is a really big cost, especially if you're thinking of going further afield. But with some good research, it sh hopefully shouldn't limit you to what you want to achieve in your period. So have a look on Google. There's lots of societies, say the Royal College of Medicine, Royal College of Surgery. Um, if you're looking at doing something in infectious diseases, the Infectious Disease Society might have a funding grant for you. And you can often get hundreds of pounds um, of funding from these specialists societies um, if you can prove to them what value your placement will have um, so yeah money is one of those kind of admin things just to sort out when you're planning it but try and plan your elective first and then see what you can propose to these societies because if you don't have a plan in the works you're not likely to get a grant so start ambitious and then see how far you get with funding applications then how do you actually go about finding these placements? Again, speak to universe, university. Often people in older years will have connections that they can put you in touch with, or you might have official partnership universities. So most medical schools have an international medical school partnership and collaboration, and they accept elective students on both sides. So that's another route to go down. And also speak to doctors. So if you're on a placement, so you want to do respiratory on elective and you're on respiratory ward, speak to them. They've definitely got links internationally and they can help you out, find something a bit more informal or point you to the right direction for a formal elective program application. And then through your MDU membership, you should be able to get access to what's called the electives network. Um, and there is a whole database of hospitals and centers that have had elective students before and the email contact details for them. And then just draft a generic cover letter and send them to everyone in the country you're interested in and just see who responds. Um, it's kind of one of those blind emailing situations, but it's worked out for almost everyone I know. Um, yeah, and you can obviously Google official university programs as well. And yeah, I think I really can't stress, like start the, the funding stuff now because so many people realize and too late and all the deadlines have gone. So, you know, start early, know when your deadlines are and often there's applications, you have to write stuff for it, but you can get like thousands of pounds from this. And especially if you're going further afield. So really, really do get on it. The other thing with the NHS bursary is 
you only get the money after the placement. So you have to do it and then you get the money, which means obviously at least you're getting the money, but you still have to fund it in the first place. So just keep that in mind when you are budgeting everything as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think I've only just got mine back and I went in April. So <laughs> there's a long delay, um, both from a medical school admin point and an NHS bursary perspective. So, yeah. yeah, just know you will get the money back, but just be prepared to front it yourself or if you can beg, borrow, not steal. <laughs> um, great. So here's there's a feedback form. We'd really love to hear your opinions. Um, on how you're feeling about final year so far and the talk today. Um, I think we'll also pop this up at the end of the, the talk. We'll go through a couple more topics. And um, if you just scan the QR code, that should take you to the form. Yeah, I mean, the QR code will come back up at the end anyway. But cool. So, I mean, I guess the next bit that we kind of want to talk about is, obviously there's so much like out there in the news about medicine at the moment but working as a doctor at the moment and it's definitely a profession in a flux there's a lot of change happening good or bad but it's happening okay so we kind of need to be ready and prepared and it's important to have a, a proper understanding i guess of what we're all getting ourselves into i mean these are some of the things that people have probably realized understood from the news already but morale i think morale definitely is a big thing i think a lot of people working in the nhs are exhausted are really struggling with it um and it's it's perhaps not as high as it once was probably contributing to this is the fact that there's all the strikes going on at the moment you know we're trying to get the pay restoration etc and remember of every wave of strikes that you partake in you're not getting paid for those days so there's also a financial hit as well to it so I mean it's nice to get the days off and I don't know everyone has their own little preferences it depends on how much you need the money but that is something always to take into consideration hopefully this is all sorted by the time you guys join hopefully there's no more strikes and it's all plain sailing but you know I thought the same from my year, so we'll see. <laughs> um, and obviously, you know, I think it would be silly not to, to mention other options because I think a lot of people are thinking this. And again, it's not my place to say whether it's a good or a bad thing, but I guess it's important to have a, a proper understanding about the NHS at the moment and, you know, there are a lot of other options that we have as as medical students and you know as finalists etc or having passed with a medical degree i mean personally uh, I, I like the job i'm going to stay i like you know it's what i want to do but there are people out there and there are a lot of people out there who definitely have other opinions and i guess some of the reasons why that I, you know i think despite all the negativity at the moment there are real glimpses of of people that care and actually when you see someone like that it's really refreshing and it really does kind of reinvigorate and make you remember what exactly you're doing and why you're doing it so there are you know there's, there's lots of grumbles and people who are down but there are you know the, the people that are up and are really enjoying it it's, it's really nice to see the camaraderie at the moment is genuinely real like everyone is working together the strikes mo almost all doctors are you know, partaking in it and striking. It's really united at the moment. And I guess the BMA have done a really good job in terms of getting getting that together. You know, I think 98% of doctors voted for the stri to strike again, etc. So it's it's fairly unanimous. And that does feed in. Also, people do kind of have your back. It's really nice. Um, whether it's doctors but also even nurses you know like i've had days where i'm on call and like i've just befriended the nurse in charge and she's now swatting away referrals for me because i'm she can tell i'm really stressed and it's nice like that people do do favors for you so despite the high stress when someone does something like that for you that can be really nice and you can obviously always make a real difference but i'm sure you know that by now and yeah don't get 
I think it's easy to think, oh, I'm just an admin monkey. I'm just going to be doing referrals, etc. But there are those moments that you do make a difference. And I think overall, they do make the job worth it. In terms of working in chess, but also even for final year, really, well-being is really important. You know, always take time out for yourself, both now where you guys are but also in a year's time it's really easy to get swallowed up into the system and just be like yeah i'm just going to work and i have to stay on two hours after because my consultant ex expects me to and i'm not going to exception report despite you know that being the official guidance etc try and you know remember that your free time is worth something and look after yourself because it's so easy to get burnt out there are always, you know, the good things, but also the bad things. And sometimes not everyone is, is treated properly. Sometimes there are incidents that happen in the hospital from colleagues, from patients where you might feel uncomfortable. I think you are ultimately, as a doctor, going to meet so many different types of people that actually, you've got, you know, you're meeting everyone under the sun, every personality under the sun. And for all the number of fantastic good people you'll meet, every now and then there will be one or two. That definitely will will make the experience less enjoyable and again remember to stand up for yourself remember the avenues of support that you'll understand as you go through the process and don't kind of just accept things because that's how you make change really and it's, it's really easy to kind of f1 it's like now i remember being a medical a medical student as a final year being like oh god how am i going to do all this stuff that this f1 is doing but actually you know, when you're there, you realize there's loads of support. If you need help, almost always it's there. It can vary in hospital depending on how available it is, but generally it's there. And I think, you know, as long as you work within your competencies, which is really what you're comfortable doing, then you will be all absolutely fine. But again, we'll, we'll do more talks later on in the year about working as an F1 and all that stuff once it's looking a bit closer in the timetable. Yeah, that's great. No, I definitely echo all of that. And people are so understanding that it's a difficult transition period. So I this is my first time clocking as an F1 or this is my second week here. And they're, they're like so helpful. And everyone knows you're a newbie because everyone starts time. So the expectation is actually really low in a nice way. Um, cool, so the SFP program, I just wanted to touch a little bit on, which I know the deadline has now passed, but for those of you have, that have applied, just wanted to talk to you about some tips that I picked up along the way that I think really made a difference. Um, so there's obviously three types of SFP program and try and prepare for your interview um, accordingly. So I think historically it was just an academic program so you might have to dig a bit deeper or talk to more people about what a medical education program is like and how you can prepare for their interviews and same with leadership i'm currently on an academic foundation program in general practice um, and i applied to london and brighton which is kss and i think as well hopefully we're going to try cover this in this sfp series that we do at mind the bleep i think there's a lot of information out there about london how london conducts their interviews but less so about how other deaneries conduct their interviews so it's really worth speaking to people that have done it before and the way you can do this is either through university um ask your clinical school who's any, has anyone gone to kss in the year above or two years above has anyone gone to west midlands um, and try and speak to someone who's actually been through that process at the place you're applying. And then secondly, another tip that I've got is um, take advantage of kind of networking. So LinkedIn is a really good source. Um, you can connect with other academic foundation doctors currently at that trust and more than often, and they're really happy to speak to you. Um, or also through mentorship programs. So Mind the Bleep also has a kind of mock interview service and um, that you should definitely sign up for and we try pair you with people that are at the trust that you're applying to or deanery um 
So yeah, figure out what that interview is actually about. And then in terms of preparing for it, find a couple of friends who are also applying for the SFP and then form a study group because preparing is hard and it can be difficult at times and it's not always the most exciting. Um, so if you can form a study group, share ideas, kind of go through um, analyzing papers together, talk through how to handle different clinical emergencies together, um, just makes it a much more enjoyable experience. I actually found people did better if they studied in groups because sometimes you don't think of things yourself um, or you can get quite lost in a book, but actually talking and verbalizing as you would in an interview is really good practice. These two books I really recommend and it's probably all you need. So the purple book, How to Read a Paper, just takes you through all the background academic knowledge that hopefully you should be familiar with. Um, but it's just a good refresher and can learn a few new phrases and kind of good buzzwords to use in interview. And then the Oxford Clinical Medicine book, we called it the cheese and onion back in Oxford. And this has an amazing emergencies chapter. It goes through everything you need to know at the right level. Um, know how you would escalate or know, or know when to escalate, what you'd prioritise. So what's more important, someone who's desaturating oxygen or someone who's become delirious, figure out what your priorities are as a clinician. And then think about how you'd assess them for an A to E and what kind of basic investigations and management will, will you be doing? So it's all about just being as safe as possible because the reason they do the clinical interview is just to check that with one less rotation, you'll be comfortable achieving your clinical competencies and be able to take time off for research. So that's all it is. You don't need to know heaps. You just need to be safe. Um, but yeah, my top tip would just to find some friends and prepare together because then you can double the amount of content you go through just by kind of being with somebody else and watching them go through a paper and presenting and then you doing the same after. Yeah, and I guess we're nearly done. We just kind of, one of the things that we kind of wanted to to really get going was a, a mentorship scheme. And we really wanted to kind of get your opinions on that, whether you'd find that useful. And also actually how you'd like to be matched in terms of whether it's with somebody who's at the deanery of your first choice or whether it's somebody who's doing a specialty that you want to do. So we have the feedback form. Um, and those questions are on there as well. And we'd really appreciate it, genuinely because actually what you guys answer will kind of affect what we organize. So no pressure, but we do really want to hear from you and kind of get a good idea of, of what kind of resources that you want in terms of, you know, if there's anything else that you'd like us to organize, obviously we have our email at finally at mindthebleak.com diet.com so if you have any questions send them there as i said at the start we're going to have super regular talks from now on hopefully okay um next one's thursday again it's oncology and palliative um and then we kind of go from there i think we've got anesthetics etc coming up we'll have two next week hopefully as well so you know we'll be posting again on the mind the bleep facebook on the instagram and again also via the medal as well if you follow mind the bleep on medal um alternatively again the, um, every med school has a rep if your med school doesn't have a rep and you want to be please get involved reach out to us again just email that email and we'll we'll, we'll get it going if you get complete the feedback form, you get a certificate. So that's always a bonus. But again, please complete the feedback. We really appreciate it. We really do act on it. So yeah, like it's really important for us. Thank you all for coming. We hope this was useful of some sort. We know that you guys are near the end of the road. You kind of know how to do things. We took that into consideration. But I guess it's just good because final year is slightly different to every other year. And yeah, to be the closing words, Kirsten. Yeah, I'd say good luck, everyone. Um, it's you're all in the same boat. It's all a daunting experience to be doing final year, but it's also really exciting. Hopefully, um, 
you're all the kind of hard work's coming to a head and then just come up to next August. So it's all very exciting time of, I think as well, it's a big time of change. I think when I was at your stage now, it's quite overwhelming to think, oh, I don't know what town I'm going to be in. I'm going to be with new friends, starting a new job, potentially in a new place. Um, so just take it easy, um, be kind to yourselves, look out for each other. And hopefully, yeah, we're here to support you guys. So please be as detailed and as honest as you want in the feedback. Um, we really, we're doing this for you um, and whatever's useful for you, um, we'll obviously do our best to try and provide. Um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, you know, about anything, just pop it in the chat. Um, we can talk about it. I'll stay around until eight. So if anyone has any questions, go for it. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming otherwise. Yeah, thanks for joining and have a good evening.